We just went through uh, uh, a challenging holiday season. Uh, I was hosp hospitalized. Christmas Eve is also John's birthday. Yeah. And uh, he was healthy. He was out cleaning the gutters actually that day and then coming down to watch the Raiders with his boys and was going to barbecue. And all of a sudden he said, um, I don't feel too good. And he, he, which he never says, and he never lays down in the middle of the day. And he laid down and um, so I said, you have two choices, Salinas or Chomp. And everyone went, aww. We went and um, got him in emergency. Um, Howie Hugo actually texted him and said happy birthday and I had his phone in my hand and I looked down and I said we're in ER and uh, he came over in his red sweater and prayed for us and then John's vital signs all dropped and um, uh, it kind of went downhill from there and then on Christmas Day they took him into ICU and they told me that I should call my family and his family and he could possibly die. But during this process, God was showing me, even though I was just crushed and broken in spirit, he was showing me little miracles of family members we hadn't seen in a long time come and appear. Um, things were happening out in the, the, the waiting room of ICU where people were down on their knees holding hands and praying. And um, those things were miraculous also. Uh, doctors held our hand and prayed. Um, Faith was uh, ministering to all the nurses and it was, um, other things were powerful during that. Then John woke up one day. A lot of people ask me, what's it like, you know, being in that coma state for 41 days? And, and uh, I, I, it's hard to explain. Uh, but it's almost like a deep sleep. And, uh, but I know that um, I was at peace uh, and, and uh, I wasn't tormented and, and you know anything like that. I was, I was at peace and I know that that was God as well. I remember I would just put on worship music because at first I couldn't even focus on reading. Uh, and I would just put that headset on. My son brought me a headset and uh, it just, the joy of the Lord would come over me and, and I had no reason to uh, to feel the way I did, but I just felt great and uh, spiritually and uh, it uh, like a peace. And, and a joy and, and, and actually the, the bold confidence that I was going to be back, uh, that, that, that uh, he was going to get me through it. And uh, for lots of reasons, I guess, you know, he just wasn't done with me. When I would come home, they would say, Mom, what are you gonna do? And I would just, I was in shock. I'd be like, oh, I'm a fix-it person. That's right, I'm supposed to fix this. Okay, and I would have to explain to them, I can't fix this. We're going to pray, God is gonna get us through this. And they began to come alongside. They had to grow up real quick. And at one point, even when I would go into meetings with doctors, I couldn't even really hear what they would say. My sons would come and interpret that for me and hold me up and actually walk me down the hall. My leg and body was giving out a little bit and um, they were praying for me and they were going to their teachers at Trinity and they were asking for prayer. And um, One of my friends started at CaringBridge.com. Um, I didn't even know what that was, but um, my boys would look at all those people praying for their dad and I just think it humbled us all. You know, it's just been, you know, an amazing journey of God's goodness and, and His grace and His mercy and His love. We won't be able to do it without our faith. That's true. I think when I see a video like that, it naturally gets me to look at my own faith. And as I've been preparing for this message today, I've been doing just that. I've been thinking a lot about faith, examining my faith. I don't know, have you ever spent time truly thinking about faith? Have you 
maybe doubted your faith or your ability to have faith or wish that you had more faith. I think it's a good thing to do. I think there's great benefit in us spending time pondering our faith. Our faith can be reflected in many different ways, can be demonstrated in many different ways, from holding on to God during a troubling time to much of what we'll talk about today. Faith is really a a misunderstood concept, I believe, for many people. But the fact is we demonstrate faith every single day. I mean, just a moment ago, I got up here, I walked down, and I stood on this platform, and I had faith that it would hold me up. Last night, I set an alarm, and I had faith that it would wake me up. I went into the kitchen, and I had faith there would be coffee there. (laughs) Turned on a light switch, had faith the lights would go on. Turned on the shower, and had faith there would be hot water and there wasn't. (laughs) Our recirculating pipe doesn't go on at 5 a.m. So it was cold when I got in there, but I had faith when I went to it. I had that expectation it was going to be there. We demonstrate faith every single day. Faith in mechanisms, faith in devices, faith in systems. Or how about when we get into a taxi or an Uber or on a bus, or on a plane. We take that faith and we, we put it in a driver or a pilot. Or how about when we send our children off to school in the morning? We put faith in teachers and administrators to teach our children, to care for our children, to, to keep our children safe. You see, we take this faith in We transfer it from devices or mechanisms or systems, and now we're putting it, this faith in people. Most of the time, people we don't know, people that haven't proven themselves to us. But but we have faith. So I'm kind of perplexed on why it's so difficult, though, when it comes to our spiritual faith. Why is it so much easier to to put faith in mechanisms and people we don't know than into God? And I think the starting point is to to look at faith and and why it is important for us to have spiritual faith. Hebrews 11.1 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So from the get-go, the reason that our spiritual faith is so important is that it is impossible to please God without it. That that is the starting point for us to bring honor to God. As we sang earlier, to, to show God that we believe he's worthy, it is through our faith. And what is faith? Well, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. Our faith is important because without it, it's impossible to please God. And this faith is a confidence in what we hope for and an assurance of what we do not see. During this sermon series, the greatest story, we've, we've broken the speaking area into three different spots. And and this one represents the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's involvement in our lives today. Faith is confidence in the Holy Spirit because that's what we hope for, that he will guide us and direct us. It's assurance because we can't see him. This is Jesus. Faith is is confidence that Jesus died for our sins and we now have eternal life with God in heaven. Now, we weren't there and 
we don't see it, but faith is confidence and assurance in that. And it's faith that the Father's love that put this all into motion is real. It's confidence that the heart of the Father is for each and every one of us. It's assurance that a loving God is present and active. You see, the heart of the Father from day one, as he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, was that he would provide for them and that they would have faith in him. He met all their needs. He gave them everything that they needed and he gave them one rule. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gave them one way to truly demonstrate their faith in him. Their understanding that they trusted him. That that he knew better. Don't eat from this tree. Here's what happened. We read in Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate of it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. They had a chance. They had an opportunity. They had one way to demonstrate their faith in the Father and it was through obedience. But instead of demonstrating faith they demonstrated a lack of faith through their actions. Imagine a tightrope stretched for a quarter of a mile above Niagara Falls. The sound of the falls overcoming all other noise and drowning it out as the water is tumbling over. And you see a man take his first step onto the tightrope, and his second and third as he walks from the United States to Canada on a tightrope. In 1859, this is what French tightrope walker Charles Blondin did. He went across this in a sack. He went across this tightrope on stilts. He went across this tightrope blindfolded. At one point, he took a small stove and a pan, cooked himself an omelet, sat down and ate it. And then, on July 15th, 1859, he walked backward from the United States to Canada. I can't even do it up here. (laughs) He came back with a wheelbarrow. As he's pushing it along, the crowd is just excited to see all that he's done. And as the story goes, he turned to the crowd and he said, who thinks I can push a person in this wheelbarrow across the tightrope? And of course, the crowd just cheered. Oh, yeah, you can do it. We've seen you do bigger things than that. So he turned to the crowd and said, who wants to get in? As you can see from the picture, it's an empty wheelbarrow. (laughs) You see, no one did. This story illustrates a real-life spiritual truth, and that is that sometimes our actions and our beliefs, they don't add up. That there's a great difference between belief, this is the faith we say we have, and action which is the faith we really have. You see, faith isn't just saying, I believe. It's acting in a way that demonstrates this faith. Hebrews 11 is a a great chapter that has a a lot of examples of faith in action. In my Bible, that section is actually labeled faith in action. And there's an accounting of many heroes of the faith and what they did. Again, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and it's assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. 
See, the people at this time were looking back at all of the heroes before them and how they were commended by their actions, and that is how they demonstrated their faith. By faith, Abel brought brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. All these people were still living by faith when they died. This is the example that we're we're given here. But you see the difference between the faith that we put or demonstrate every day in our daily lives when we set an alarm, turn on a light switch, get in a car, send our children to school. The difference between that and this spiritual faith is is significant. And it's the object of that faith. You see, what we're talking about today is the fact that our faith is only as good as what or who we put that faith in. We've got to get back to the, the center of the story, and that's the sun. Hebrews continues in chapter 12, and, and what we read there in verse 1 is, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since we have all of the examples of those before us who demonstrated their faith through their actions, because of that, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And I think if we stop right there, we can read this verse and say, okay, It says keep running. The writer of Hebrews wanted us to know that we need to persevere, that we need to keep going. Because we've seen these people before us do amazing things, let's just keep going. We addressed this just a few weeks ago in in our Promises series where we talked about the danger of taking a, a few words or a verse out of the Bible and saying that's what we're supposed to do. And losing the context of it all. Because really when we continue on in verse 2 we read, Fixing our eyes on Jesus. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who suffered such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This isn't about persevering. This isn't about continuing to run. It's about keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. I think often as we seek to live out our Christian faith, it's it's easy to take our eyes off Jesus. I love the story of Peter, when he decides to get out of the boat, when he asks Jesus if he can walk on water, and he's doing pretty well until he took his eyes off Jesus. Sometimes I know it's easy for me to get confident in the way things are going or how I'm handling things and taking my eyes off Jesus. But we're called to fix our eyes on Jesus. Jesus made himself nothing. He became a servant and he gave his life up for you and for me. For the joy of saving us, Jesus endured the cross. Living a life of faith. Of living a life of faith. It means following the example of Jesus every single day. Again, we can't do this on our own. And we're not asked to. Jesus shows us the course. Jesus goes ahead of us. He shows us the proper attitude. He sets the pace. And he leads us to victory. When we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. I'd like to read from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. 
And we read, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. I'm sure most of you have heard these words before, but, but are, we, are we living this way? Are we living our lives in a way that we truly embrace the idea that faith without action is dead? Is that, is that visible in how we live our lives? Can others look upon our lives and, and what we do and say, now that person, they've got a solid faith in Jesus. I see it in their decisions. I see it in their attitudes. I see it in every part of their life. And I think this is important to take this moment to say, James, and this is the brother of Jesus, he isn't saying this is how we earn salvation. He isn't saying the way to heaven, eternity to the Father is through deeds. Not even close. In fact, he says, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. You see, his works, his actions, his deeds weren't in place of his faith. They were what made his faith complete. Every time I get an opportunity to, to be in front of a group, whether it's my Bible study group on a weekly basis, a one-on-one -on -one person I'm meeting with, or you... I go back to this verse, this passage actually in Hebrews 10, and it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I take my responsibility here seriously. And that as we're in a place where we are meeting together, it is my role to spur you on toward love and good deeds. To live a life of living faith that is demonstrated through actions. I believe for us to leave here without a next step or an action, we'll be missing it. And we must put our faith into action. And I'd like to spend the last few minutes talking about what it looks like to have a living faith. You see, James said that a faith without action is dead. He didn't say that it's gone or that it's disappeared or that it never existed. He said that it's dead. And what I believe the opposite of that is a living faith, a faith that is alive and is demonstrated through action. So I got some points of, of natural steps that I believe that we can take. And the first one is to start with prayer. I believe that when we want to live a life of faith that is living, breathing, and active. It starts here with the Holy Spirit. It's praying. It's asking God to, to show us what he wants us to do. It's asking God to give us the strength that we need, the eyes to see opportunities, the courage when it's difficult, the wisdom to prioritize. But it starts with prayer. As we want to live out a life of faith that is Demonstrated through action, we start with prayer. And I think the next natural step is to love and serve your family. 
this can be hard. But I really believe that all the good that we do starts at home. That the habits that we build in our home are what transcend out into the world. It's somehow in the home, it's hard. My family drives me crazy. And I do the same. But that's where it begins. What a better place. There is no better place to practice, to, to build the skills and to love and to serve your family. Meet your neighbors. Another difficult place as well. It's so hard sometimes to interact with neighbors in a way that's positive. We have neighbors with barking dogs or maybe neighbors whose kids are causing your fence to fall down one board at a time as they kick soccer balls at it. It's not me, not my neighbor at all. It's hard sometimes. But that's a great example. In my neighborhood, my neighbors and their balls flying over the fence constantly and literally going through the fence as boards are falling on our side. How do I love them? How do I care for them? I found one way so far is to keep rebuilding the fence, to keep giving the balls back. Now, probably at some point, we're going to have to build a new fence, and it's going to have to be concrete. But for right now, <laughs> for right now, the way that I'm able to reach out to my neighbors is by doing that. Because here's the thing. Sometimes you're going to do something big. Sometimes you're going to do something small. But let's not discount the small things and just look for the big things. Volunteer at your child's school. Share a meal with someone. Serve here at Shoreline. We have so many opportunities here to put your faith into action. You can stop by the Connection Center, fill out a, a card and let them know, I want to put my faith into action and we'll have people come alongside you and, and meet with you and share opportunities for you to do that. We do a lot outside this building, around the world, and, and even here. And like I said, you can serve in big ways. You can travel around the world. You can serve in small ways by smiling to someone, opening up a door. You can make a phone call to someone who you think might need it, of course, you're being led by prayer in the Holy Spirit. You can write a note. You can promote peace. In the Beatitudes in math, it says, blessed, in Matthew, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. One of the calls on Christians, those of us who know Jesus, is to promote peace in this world. In our family, with our neighbors, in our workplace, on the road, around our state, around our country, around the world, we have got the opportunity so often to be promoters of peace or disruptors of peace. And if through prayer, through the strength of the Holy Spirit, through his guiding, his leading, we promote peace, then we're so much better equipped to reflect God's love, Jesus, to this world one of the greatest ways to promote peace is to demonstrate grace and forgiveness. When you've been wronged, instead of seeking retribution, instead of seeking consequences, instead of seeking punishment, what if we sought to demonstrate grace and forgiveness? For me personally, it's in my home where that's the, the starting point again because that's where it's hardest to demonstrate grace and hardest to demonstrate forgiveness. Listen to people. I mean really listen to people. Not put up with them long enough to hear what they have to say, but hear what they're saying. I've realized through a lot of my wife's prompting and counselors and experts that, that our kids often are trying to say something to us well beyond their actions. That if we actually stop and we really listen, we see that there's a need that's not being met. We see that there's something deeper that's causing it. 
I venture to say most of the interactions we have in our life, if we would stop and listen, we'd find out that there's something deeper going on. And maybe that's our opportunity to demonstrate grace, to demonstrate forgiveness, to show love, and share your faith with someone in need. And I specifically wrote someone in need because I think we can see someone who's hungry and see that there's a need. We can see someone without a home and see that they're in need. We can see someone in the intensive care unit and say, oh, they're in need. But I think often when we see someone without Jesus, the first thing that comes to mind isn't, oh, they're in need. But the fact is, a life without Jesus is the neediest life out there. And we have got to find opportunities to share Jesus with this world. Partner with organizations that are already making a difference. Shoreline Community Church is one. International Justice Mission is fighting human trafficking around the world. We've got Samaritan's Purse and World Mission and so many organizations that are out there. You don't need to start this on your own. You don't need to make it happen on your own. But you do need to keep your eyes open and then act on opportunities. If we start in prayer, ask God to show us what's available, how he wants to use us, then he makes those known to us. We need to then, through his strength, take actions on those. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as though working for the Lord, not human masters. As we seek to make an impact on this world and to change this world, it's not because we want the world to be a better place, but it's because we want to please our Heavenly Father, because we want to do our work for Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, I pray that you would use us, that the way we live our lives would be pleasing to you, and that through our lives, more and more people would come to know you through Jesus, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, and that this world would be transformed, not just for the here and now, but lives for eternity. I ask that you would use each of us to achieve that. I pray that's in Jesus' name. Amen.